Welcome to Exploring Computing. Today's video is Introduction to HTML, Hypertext Markup Language. So in the last lecture, we saw the origins of the World Wide Web, and we spent some time understanding what hypertext means. And previously, in the last lecture, we took a look at HTTP, which is a hypertext transport protocol. We're going to begin this lecture by considering what the relationship between the HTTP protocol and the HTML hypertext markup language is. And then we're actually going to study how HTML actually works. And in the following video, we're going to get some hands-on practice using HTML. By the end of these two videos, you should be able to make your own web pages. Let's start off with a quick review from last lecture. So you recall that HTTP stands for Hypertext Transport Protocol, and this is a protocol that governs how two computers on the World Wide Web interact. And so a computer can make a request to a web server asking for a particular file, and the web server will respond by sending the file. The files actually can have any one of a number of formats. The most common is probably the HTML file, which was what we're going to be talking about in this lecture. But cascading style sheet files or CSS files are also quite common, and we'll study that in the next lecture. And of course, the image files that we've talked about in our second lecture of this, the quarter are also commonly used. And it turns out that HTTP does not actually specify the formats of any of these files. HTTP simply tells two computers on the web how one computer can send a request to another computer asking for a file to be sent back. It does not specify the format of the files themselves. And so there are many other types of files that could be sent by the World Wide Web, such as video files. And again, in fact, you could come up with new file types and HTTP doesn't really care what the file types are. It's just designed so that one computer can request a particular file of the other computer without regard to what the internal format of that file is. Now, HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language, and as I've suggested, it is the most common file format. So that's what we're going to take a look at now. And it is a key file format, and any web page on the World Wide Web needs to have an HTML file in addition to whatever other files are included. So HTML, as I've suggested, stands for Hypertext Markup Language, and we've seen what hypertext means from the last lecture. And language more or less refers to what you'd expect. And it turns out that computer languages have many similarities with human languages. They have their own grammar, they have their vocabulary. They're not that different from French or Japanese or whatever other human languages that you've learned. But this other part, markup, we haven't talked about that. So let's talk a little bit about markup and what that all means. So the term markup comes from publishing. So what I have here is I have a World Wide Web page from the Stanford Daily. So one question to ask is, did the author of this particular article make decisions like whether or not a particular photo should appear in the article or whether the caption appearing underneath the photo should appear in with a light gray background? If the date of the article should appear in sans serif font in light gray? or if that first sentence in the article was written in bold. So I've not talked to the particular author of this article, George Chen, but I have talked to other Stanford Daily writers and they tell me that that's not how it works. And in fact, that's not traditionally how it would work in publishing. So that's not really a surprise. So typically what's gonna happen is the author is just going to write the text of the article and then somebody else say an editor will go in and make decisions on what sort of formatting should appear in the article. So we could say, oh, I want this first section up here, this title, I want it to appear in bold 24 point font. And maybe I want that byline underneath it to appear in sans serif font. We'll talk about what sans serif means in another lecture if, if you're not familiar with the term. And then I want to go ahead and insert a photo in there. So these are all decisions that somebody other than the author would make. And traditionally, the editor would actually write these comments down using what's called markup. So what I've done here is I've marked up the original text from the author, providing markup comments that will be used by whoever does the typesetting for the publishing. And so this is really what HTML is all about. So in HTML, we're going to use this form of markup in order to tell the computer how to display their web pages. So 
let's take a look at HTML. We've seen what hypertext is. We've just learned what markup is. And this is a language. And I'll be talking in another lecture a little bit more closely about the similarities and differences between human languages and computer languages. It turns out an awful lot of what drives HTML, though, is this concept of markup that we've just gone over. So let's say we want to create a web page that says Go Stanford, and we want the Go to appear in italics and Stanford to appear in bold. If I were working with a human typesetter, I could just go ahead and do my scrawled markup using a pen like this, but that's not gonna work with a computer. Computers are getting better at reading handwritten stuff, but we're not really quite there yet. So this is what it's gonna look like in HTML. Basically, I'm providing the same information that I would to a human typesetter, but I'm gonna do it in a more formal manner that's easier for the computer to process. What we're seeing here, these are what are referred to as tags. The tags often work in pairs. So I have a start tag and an end tag, where the end tag is the same as a start tag, except for it has a slash in front of it. We also talk about these as elements. So the element consists of the start tag, the end tag, and whatever goes between the start and end tag. Here I have an I element, which stands for an italics element, and a B element, which stands for bold element. And in fact, the key to learning how HTML works is to learn all the different tags. This is actually a fairly large subset of the tags. And we'll be providing you with a list of tags that you can look over. There really aren't that many tags. So what I recommend is at some point, you either look through the list that we'll be providing you, which is probably the vast majority of the tags that are used in widespread use, or you look at an official list, which is a bit bigger than the list I'll be providing you with, and just get a sense of what the tags that are that are out there. You don't need to memorize the tags, but you do want to have some familiarity with what's available. And then when you need a particular tag, you're like, oh, I want to create a bulleted list. You'll remember, oh, I seem to recall there's a, there's, there's a tag for that, and then you can go ahead and look it up. We sometimes refer to the elements as containers. And in this particular case, I have the italics element. And then you can see that the bold element contains both the italics element as well as the word Stanford. You do need to maintain this containing relationship. So if I try and mix the two as shown here, that actually turns out to be illegal. So don't do that. An element must be completely contained within another element. We can't have an element partially containing an element. Sometimes the tags themselves don't provide sufficient information and we need to add additional information. Suppose I wanted to link the word Stanford here to the actual Stanford website. It turns out that the tag used to link from one website to another is the A tag, which stands for anchor. But I need to provide additional information telling what the website I'm linking to is. And so here I've added in what's called an attribute value pair. The href stands for hypertext reference, and I'm providing the anchor tag with additional information telling it where the anchor is linked to. Some tags don't actually work in pairs. So suppose I want to create a line break. A line break is going to allow me to basically have a carriage return in the middle of a line. I could have a line break start tag and a line break end tag, but that doesn't make a huge amount of sense. And so this particular tag can be done without a start and end tag. And I'm gonna indicate that using a closing slash as shown here. One thing that you'll notice if you start trying to create these web pages is that it turns out that if you put carriage returns or spaces or tabs into a document, those actually all get combined into a single space. So basically what HTML is gonna do is it's gonna take any what it's referred to as white space. So in computer science, we refer to white space. We're talking about any of the characters which can create blank space on a web page. That includes the carriage returns, the tabs, and the spaces. It will take all the white space you enter and it will just treat it as a single space. So here I've said go Stanford in my source. That's in my source HTML. I put in a couple of carriage returns. I put in another go cardinal, put in a couple of carriage returns. And then when it actually gets displayed, it's as if those carriage returns or any tabs I entered or whatever I entered is just gonna be treated as a single space. So what's the solution here? Well, it turns out that there is a special tag 
which I need to use in order to get these to appear in paragraphs. So there's a paragraph tag. And so I go ahead and create two paragraph elements here. You may be wondering what the relationship between the paragraph tag is and the line break tag we saw earlier. Notice these paragraphs have a blank line between them. If I were to use a line break, as I show here, there is no blank line between the two lines. So the line break does create a carriage return between the two lines, but it does not create a blank line, whereas the paragraph typically will create a blank line between the two paragraphs. Although we'll see next lecture when we start learning cascading style sheets, you can actually control exactly what the paragraph tag does. If you want the paragraph tag to create two blank lines, great, go ahead and do it. If you want the paragraph tag to create no blank lines, you could do that as well. We'll learn about that next lecture. Also notice because HTML doesn't care about extra white space, if I have the line break tag followed by a carriage return, that creates the web page we've seen here. But if I don't have a carriage return and I just have it all in one line, I get the exact same result. Another tag that's pretty useful is the H1 tag. It's used to create a heading. And so H1 is the most important heading, but there's actually six different types of headings with H1 being the most important and H6 being the least important. You may be wondering at this point, what if I want to set the foreground or background color of my text? Or what if I want to change the font? Or how can I tr control alignment and have it right aligned or left aligned or center aligned? And it turns out that while once upon a time we did do this with HTML, we no longer do it with HTML. We now do it using cascading style sheets. And this is a legacy of our physics past. So remember, HTML was originally created for physics papers, and they really didn't need that much formatting. But modern web pages are created by graphic artists and other media professionals, and they want a lot more control. So we've taken a lot of the simple formatting that was available in the original HTML for physics papers, and we've actually moved it to a second language called Cascading Style Sheets, which I'll talk about next lecture. In addition to the tags which we've gone over, which structure the web page itself, there's some additional tags which you need to provide for all web pages. And what you're seeing here is, here's some additional tags that are needed to have a well-formatted HTML file. Up at the top, I've got the doc type. This is a bit of an odd tag, and it doesn't really follow the, the syntax rules of the other tags. You can see it starts off with an exclamation point, and it has a capital doc type. It's standalone, but does not have an ending slash. You do need to include this, although as you can see from my little comment here, it's mostly not used anymore, but you do need to include it. It used to specify all sorts of things like, hey, this is HTML4, this is XHTML1, and we'll talk a bit later, but the web browser manufacturers are trying to get rid of all the version numbers. However, if you do not have the version at all, it turns out that this is going to cause the web browser to think that you have a really, really old web page, create it back before the doc type tag was included, and it will throw your web browser into a weird mode called quirks mode and you don't want that to happen. So even though I'm just specifying the doc type as HTML instead of HTML4, HTML5, XHTML1, you still do need to provide the doc type. So don't forget that. Otherwise you may get some really weird looking web pages. Okay, so there's an HTML start and end tag that surrounds everything. And then I have this head section and body section. So let's take a look at those. The head section provides information about the web page, and the body section provides the actual contents of the web page. Let's take a closer look at that head section. You can see that the head section includes the character encoding, and this is what we talked about the first lecture, where we talked about ASCII, we talked about ISO 8859, which allowed us to do something like Western European, Eastern European Cyrillic, and a couple other things all fitting into a single byte. And then we talked about Unicode, and so this is where you're going to specify what sort of encoding your HTML source file is using. And then there's a title. And the title is what appears on the tab in the web browser. And notice from this image here that 
the title does not actually appear on the web page itself. So in this case, I've used the title title for tab and notice title for tab does not actually appear in the actual contents of the web page. It only appears on the tab of the web browser. So this sort of emphasizes what I mentioned earlier. The head is things about the web page. It's not the actual web page contents. And we'll see throughout our study of HTML and CSS that there's a variety of different information that goes into the head. So for now, it seems pretty simple, but we will be adding some extra information into this section. And then the body is whatever actually appears on the web page itself. There are a number of different versions of HTML, as I alluded to a bit earlier. The current version of HTML is HTML5, but as I suggested, the web browser manufacturers are not super happy with version numbers. I think one of the things that's going on is they don't like having specific version numbers and then people pointing at them saying, hey, you are not fully supporting this version. So this is a reason why we've gotten rid of the version numbers in the doc type. In addition to just the different version numbers like HTML 3.2, HTML 4, HTML 4.1, XHTML 1, there are several variants of HTML. The variant that I'm using is called XHTML. And XHTML has a set of more formal rules than standard HTML. So for example, in standard HTML, if I were to write head for the head section, I could write it in lowercase, I could write it in all caps, I could even mix the casing having a capital H, a lowercase e, an uppercase a, and a lowercase d, and those would all be legal. In XHTML, they're like, wait, 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 this is out of hand, please write your tags in lowercase letters. That closing slash that I had on the line break, that's actually not necessary in HTML, but I use it because I like the students when they see that I've written a tag that has only a tag instead of a pair with a start tag and an end tag. I like them to see that slash at the end and realize immediately, oh, that's a standalone tag. This is not part of a pair. And then finally is another example between XHTML and standard HTML. XHTML requires that all attribute value pairs have the value in quotes, whereas HTML has a bunch of different rules for whether or not quotes are necessary. So basically, the XHTML variant I'm using is just going to lead to more uniform looking code. And I would strongly recommend that you use it for your code. I think it's actually quite common. And probably amongst professional web pages, it's used more often than not. All right, so that's our little introduction to HTML. In the next video, we're going to take you on a hands-on look on how to actually create an HTML file and how to, to load it into a web browser and how to test it. I'll talk to you soon.